Hello, Michael. Hey, Sandy. How are you doing? Hey, good. How are you? I'm not too bad. You sound clear and awesome. Yeah, no, I, I stole my friend's headphones. They're like $8,000 headphones. Just <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, this is, like, this is like the best Skype call ever on Everyday Poetry. I'm sorry. I'll try not to screw it up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's really going downhill now. Someone else wearing headset though, like a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you know, do you know Andrew McBadgen Ketchum? Oh yeah, yeah, I know him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he had these like he thought he had these great headsets, and it mm-hmm. just didn't work, and it went south. He's gonna actually come <laughs> into the studio like next week to to oh. pick up where we left off. But yeah, I, I sorry about the stumbling there a little. I love that trouble with Hammer's poem, and I, it wasn't. I was having difficulty um, pulling it up on my device. I thought I had it saved there. And, Oh, okay. Yeah, beautiful. But I love I love everything that uh, you're planning to read as well. And you're calling in from where? Fresno? Fresno, California. Because somebody had to. So. <laughs> yeah, somebody had to. <laughs> and is it just beautiful there all the time, or what? Um, well, I mean, it's California, so that's awesome. But uh, we're in yeah. the valley, so it's like full of smog and sadness. So we're surrounded by happiness. Smog and sadness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, I guess that's quite a bit of inspiration for a poet then. Yeah. Smog yeah. and sadness. <laughs> Makes me want to just hang up and go right. Okay, so so um Karen Wyant uh previewed your work here for our show and it really you know, it really embodies we started the show as really central uh working class poetry. So mm-hmm. uh she read from blue collar eulogies. And but we're really, you know, we're broader than that as well. Anything that is Place based, accessible in some way, and mm-hmm. uh, speaks to you know the everyday experience. And um, yeah, so we loved the preview we got from there. And um, I read a bit of your bio, but could you tell me, Blue Collar Eulogies? Was that what number book was that for you? Uh, that was my second book. Second, okay. Yeah. So, and you have uh, four? Now? Yeah, four poetry books, and then like five chat books, kind of sprinkled in there. Okay. And your background is interesting because it said that, now you gave me that brief bio, but I read a lot more about you, and you, apparently you took, you didn't come to poetry from point A to point B directly, but sort of indirectly after doing some other kinds of work? Well, it was kind of weird. I, uh, I grew up writing fantasy, actually, science fiction and fantasy, and then I started writing poetry probably when I was about 20. Uh, like, the mm-hmm. catalyst for me was my mom passing away, and I was sort of, uh-huh. you know, kind of dealing with my grief. And I had kind of some, some birth effects and stuff that kind of made me, gave me uh, parts of a rough childhood, I guess. Uh, yeah. so, and, and kind of dealing with all of that, I turned to poetry because it just felt more immediate. And so basically from like 20 to 30 or so, I kind of shifted more primarily to poetry. And then after that, I started doing both pretty much equally. Wow. See, that's, I don't know anyone like you. Anyone like you. <laughs> I don't either. It's really a pain. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very lonely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, I, I, it's, here's what's astounding, starting to write at 20, because your, I mean, your voice and your work is, uh, you kind of went from zero to 60. How do you account for that? For well, that? you didn't see those 16,000 horrible poems that I have on my hard drive. So. Oh, really? Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, that's hard to believe, but... Oh, uh, believe it. Trust me. <laughs> but you were writing the fantasy and everything, and I have to say I'm, like, completely clueless about all that, so I'll have to look into uh, your work there a bit more. But, but you... Where did you go to study then? I mean, you, you were working at, like, data entry and mm-hmm. other... Uh, interesting, like taking urine samples at the rehab center or something. I mean, like, you really have the stellar resume for a late blooming poet. <laughs> so, before you read, just take me a bit, a bit back to how, you know, you came, you were in those careers, in which, you know, obviously were uh, taking you somewhere, but then you, did you just decide to go to get an MFA or what? Well, I guess it was probably started later in my undergrad. I didn't really know anything about contemporary poetry. I mean, all I knew about poetry is what I had heard in high school, which was pretty much stopped at Shakespeare. Right. Yeah, uh, it's like the big door opening. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, then I had a really great teacher, Tom Simmons, when I was an undergrad, uh, and he was a contemporary poet, and he introduced right. me to the work of Marie Howe. And then I read, oh, yeah, oh, I read, I read oh, What oh. the Living Do, and, uh, oh, and I read it just oh, the right I, time. That's, 
Oh man, yeah. that's such a seminal book. That's that's an extremely important book for me too. Sorry. Mm, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. It was like reading Catcher in the Rye at just the right time. Like oh, it, yeah. it, it, it opened all these doors. Uh, oh. So I just started writing and writing and writing and reading and reading and reading. And I was at the University oh. of Iowa, so they had a bookstore, a Playwrights okay. bookstore, and they had just stacks and stacks of magazines there. Uh, so I would just wow. go and just just read blind. I didn't even know what to read. Uh, then I um, read Crab Orchard Review, and I really, really liked it. I started learning more about SIU, um, Allison Joseph, Rodney Jones, and Judy Jordan. And then um, oh, fell in love with that program, then went and studied there, and you know, they, they learned me good. So. Oh, awesome. That's, oh, wow, that's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, like I said, this contempor- the idea of contemporary poetry is really foreign for a lot of people and students. I, I, I teach a lot of one-on-one, and I get to teach a little poetry at yeah, yeah. But like It's like, whoa, you mean we can write about this? And, yeah, uh, yeah the whole door just opens up. So I hate to put you on the spot, but cause I, do you have the trouble with hammers on you? Um, yeah, I do, actually. Okay. Mm-hmm. Do you mind? Because you get to read, you can read all those other ones as well. We'll have time. Um, but since I kind of dropped the ball on that one, <laughs> I dropped the nail or whatever you want to say. Whatever it was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you feel it, I, I think it's kind of a nice introduction for listeners to your Sure. Book. Got it right here. Great. The trouble with hammers. The trouble with owning hammers is that you have to store them somewhere on pegs or at least in a drawer or inside an emptied out tackle box long after the house is built and the circus folded like an envelope on the backs of unfamiliar trucks running all night from Maine to Hollywood. I want to go by three names like child actors and serial killers. My father kept hammers in a drawer and once when he stopped by but I was out, he nailed a two by four he stole from a construction site under the sagging cushions of my couch. I keep my hammers in a closet, but he found them anyway. I would like to be a hammer, I think, and swing all day down on the heads of thin, unsuspecting nails, even though I'm not particularly violent or unmedicated, if that matters. It's true I was never any good at math ever since that one bronze star in fifth grade, and I know you're not supposed to begin a speech or say in a poem how nervous you are. But I think there are more nails than people and more hammers than people. And I really have these constant reminders that nothing built after the pyramid seems able to hold together for long. Not just relationships, but other things like bookshelves, governments, the new consensus on circumcision. They say man's first tool was a hammer, which makes sense, since I can't imagine apes working a protractor, much less a sextant under the wet stars. But each time I swing, I can feel my own head loosen from its shaft of lacquered bone, and I know once it flies, it will never be tight again. I don't know if you could hear me stifling my... (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's so brilliant, but also so funny. Maybe, I don't know, unintentionally, but God, what what leaps (laughs) you make in there. Where in the world? And you know what? Here was my problem. I sometimes I capture uh, poems in a photograph for my phone to read on air, so I don't have to like fumble and. Oh yeah, yeah. And know that I, had, I thought that there was. I thought I could cut it off, but I didn't. So here I could have read it, but it's better you reading it. But where is this? And this is the uh, uh, your website name as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The trouble with hammers, just so we can let our listeners know, because they do buy books and they do follow poets that we that we feature here so folks yeah go to that site and find out more about michael where where did this poem come from and where in your um like how old is it uh this is actually one of my earlier ones i think it was first or second year in grad school i think um oh, i've been okay. yeah i've been thinking about the the, the i think it's a billy collins, yeah, billy collins poem the trouble with poetry and just that uh, phrase yeah. kept spinning around mm-hmm. in my head at the same time, yeah. I was reading a lot of Bob Hickok, who I just love for these wild, crazy leaps he makes all the time. Like, he just yes, built the farm on every poem. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm Yeah, and I've always been very narrative, so I was trying to push myself to just make uh, more leapy stuff and just not, okay. not, not really necessarily know what I was doing, just kind of fly by on the right. pilot. So. Right. I love... Uh, it, it, I, not good at math ever since the one bond started fifth grade. And I know you're not supposed to begin a speech or say in a poem how nervous you are. <laughs> but I think there are more nails than people and more hammers than people. And then uh, and then you go to from that to 
uh, constant reminders that nothing built after the pyramids seems able to hold together for long. And then I love these, not just relationships, but other things, like bookshelves, government, <laughs> and the new, the new consensus on circumcision. Oh, man. Yeah. So, brilliant. Love it. Love it. Um, so, you were start. You, you must have taken all these sort of craft tools and uh, tool, I hate to say tools after you about Amber's, but all these craft tools and you seem like you took to the technique and the language of poetry so quickly for diving in at 20. So it just seems something like you'd come home to or something natural? Um, I want to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, I mean, eventually it did. I, I think at some point in grad school, maybe about halfway through, I remember I was walking to, uh, I don't think I was walking from workshop to teach or the other way around, and I had this like sudden feeling of, oh, wow, this is exactly where I want to be and this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. Uh, for like mm. the first time in my life, probably, I, I had that feeling. Uh, mm. But yeah. before that, I, I think it's kind of like before anything becomes instinct, it, it has to be learned, which sounds preachy, I know. But I, I'm just yeah. thinking of all the god-awful poems I wrote, especially in undergrad workshops, where I didn't, um, yeah. I didn't exactly know. Yeah, it, it just kind of like wood carving. You know, I didn't really know how to start. Yeah. I would just, you know, slashing away at this block of wood. I like uh, the wood yeah. carving, yeah. And just trying out every voice I could think of. Yeah, I was reading, you know, like, I, I'd read from, you know, go from the beats to, like, D.H. Lawrence to, like, yeah, really have Sherman <laughs> Uh Then I read a lot of, like, quote-unquote Eastern poetry. That was uh, all these disparate voices. I was trying to kind of yeah. weave it together into something. I love, yeah, I love talking about voice. Um, I want you to read more poems very soon, too. But, like, I, I mean, recently, I had a voice, I found a voice, you know, had it back in 2012, had a, had a little book, but, like, I, it, the interesting thing is how that changes, how your voice changes, and then you haven't quite caught up with it, but, and um, I wonder if that's happened to you, like, what you say, you know, you tried a lot, you found your voice, mm -hmm. but, like, have, have you found in subsequent boy, books it changing and evolving? Even? I, I say definitely, yeah, and probably without me even realizing it. Um, yeah. Cause I yeah. tend to sort of try to absorb something from everything that I read, uh, whether I'm drawn to the book or not, whether it's my particular style or not. And I, after a while, I'll start to notice, oh, I'm, I'm kind of writing like Stephen Dobbins right now, or I'm kind of writing like uh, Leo <laughs> Lee right now or something. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, I love that. So like you've got a lot of people singing your praises, and a lot of people that I love singing your praises. Yeah, I brought a lot of people. Oh. Yeah, it was all, it's all fake. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. You, you had a little cocktail for them <laughs> one day. They wrote this stuff. But like Thomas Lux and uh, Rodney Jones, uh, for Salvation Blues, he says, Meyerhofer has the inner resources and the craft to address worlds imagined and ideal, but he insists on writing chiefly of this one, and he does it fearlessly, masking neither warmth nor anger. He reminds me of a young James Wright. He reveals the heart, as do few other poets, who have suffered an education. <laughs> How well put. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, that and, was and great. What, yeah. what do you think about being compared to James Wright? I, I will very gladly take that. Actually, I was, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I had a big ego for about, I think, a week after that, because he, he'd, <laughs> he'd written that, and then I won the James Wright Poetry Award through the American Review. So I was off yeah, and so I was like, okay, I was the greatest person. Work. And then, it, then yeah. that, that faded in about a week. <laughs> Uh, well, it was something to take to the bank for, yeah, yeah, for that yeah. week. So, um, so let's show our listeners a little bit more of uh, how you do do this, your worlds. And uh, I know you have some sort of favorite ones or ones that you like to read, and I love all of these. So well, you just pick one that you uh, feel like reading. Sure. Uh, here's one. Uh, I tend to write about like, a lot of my background because I grew up like really, really poor, but like a lot of Midwestern yeah. uh poor kids. Okay. We never talked about being poor, exactly. We always yeah. kind, of, kind of pretend that we yeah. weren't, but it would kind of like leak out into, into the way we talk sometimes. Um, for these little passive aggressive things. Uh, I love so, that. Yeah. Which one's called dedication. Okay. In our house, not once did we hear someone say, you're welcome, and answer to thanks. Instead, it's all right. Backhanded reminder of the sacrifice of this or that dollar store trinket cost folks well below the poverty line. This is a hard habit to break. Don't worry, it's fine when you thank me for helping you move furniture or coming to your reading, your wedding, your beloved's funeral. 
oh, it's all right, the students, when they thank me for margin comments, for letting them turn in assignments half a semester late. It's all right. The door held open a few seconds longer for the jock on crutches, for the blue-eyed girl breathing into the straw fixed to her wheelchair. I want to thank the moon for tilting in time to highlight the rain spilling off a parked windshield. My body for keeping itself free so far from cancer, diabetes, suicide. I want to thank my fear of death for melting whenever a beautiful woman bends to drink from a fountain. I want to thank the crows for mating on any windowsill but mine. And their answer rising in chorus with each day's rusty sunset. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Michael, 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 <laughs> this poem, come on. I love this. And I, I have a lot of masculine energy in me, but I, I, I think my favorite line is, I want to thank my fear of death for melting whenever a beautiful woman bends to drink from a fountain. <laughs> I mean, it's just too true. And... When you go to, I want to thank the moon for tilting in time to highlight the rain spilling off a parked windshield. I mean, ah, yeah, it's like, I, you tell your students, like, close your eyes, they're in this experience or whatever, and they're trying to write, and it's like, close your eyes and think, like, really what was happening, or what you saw, and it is, it's the stupid light off of a windshield, or the way you know, a shadow cast down at a certain moment. And why do we remember those things? Well, I mean, that, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Well, no, the, that particular image, uh, it's like these are all just sort of things you put in your, in your arsenal to use eventually. But that particular yeah. image, I think it was like probably six or seven years earlier, I was arguing with my girlfriend at the time, having some like melodramatic teenage argument. And yeah. I was like, we were sitting in a car at a, at a parking lot or something. And uh, the rain it was raining, and then the the moon was shining through the uh, the shadows of the rain. So mm -hmm. while we we're fighting, there was like this 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 kind of beautiful rain shadow kind of flooding mm -hmm. the car. <laughs> and I just remember that image yeah. and uh, just oh, like how God, how it yeah. contrasted with just the silliness of what we were arguing about. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I mean, I can't love those lines more. Um, oh. <laughs> and and also just the the humor and, and funniness of like, oh, it's all right to students when they thank me for margin comments. I mean, that's my life right now. So oh, I understand. I yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I'm grading like, what, three classes of comp, their first personal narrative. Oh, God. Before, yeah, yeah. Say. I'm doing the same thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so what do you teach? Let me ask you that. Yeah. Well, right now I'm just teaching composition. Uh, in the past I've taught everything from like, you know, advanced creative writing to composition, tech writing, uh, honors English, just whatever they let me teach at wow. whatever place. We're in the same boat. But you know, sometimes these one I get to teach one advanced poetry course too, but mm -hmm. the rest is comp, really yeah. one on one, one two. But I'm like finding this year, I don't know what it is, what's in the water, but like these kids are writing like mm -hmm. they're writing like, they're in creative writing, some yeah. of them, the personal narrative, and it's so heartening. And, uh, yeah, it's not, it hasn't been uh, boring yet at all or tedious. But was to ask me in, like, a couple, ask me in, like, a month from now. But, um, so, yeah, I get it. And the, now, what about this not being able to say you're welcome? You said the poor, you didn't act, you didn't really talk about being poor because you're Midwestern, which I kind of get that because, like, I'm German, I'm from German immigrants, so nobody talked about yeah. how much money you made or anything. So, like, yeah, I feel like today everyone talks about everything, but, like, yeah. there's a little bit of that tradition. I don't know exactly how old you are when you grew up, but, like, your parents, they don't, they don't, like, let that leak out, but then you said, like, sort of leak out, you know? And so this ability not to say, inability to say, uh, you're welcome. What, was that something that, you know, just stuck with you through childhood or something you remembered later? Or what, what about that? Well, it stuck with me, and I think... I don't even remember exactly how old I was, probably 20, 22 or something. And finally someone called me out on it. So why do you keep saying oh, it's all right? <laughs> when I, when you, why do you just say you're welcome, ass? Yeah. Like, okay. What about like people that say no problem to everything? No, no, I, I still do that. It's a really bad habit. I try not to, but uh, no, I still do that all the time. Like, yeah, no, I wasn't like, apologizing. Like, I was saying thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little quirky. You know, just to be able to take something like that and make art high art of it yeah. I love. so yeah so let's let's go to another uh michael meyerhofer poem and listeners um 
If you just tuned in, you're listening to WRFN Radio, Free Nashville here. We're a nonprofit historic grassroots radio station, and we are featuring today Michael Meyerhofer here on Everyday Poetry, Poetry for the People. So we're here at 107.1, 103.7 FM, or tell your friends to get online at www.radiofreenashville.org and listen as we hear uh, Michael Meyerhofer read another gem. Well, thank you for the introduction. Okay. Uh, this one's called... Uh, <laughs> this one's my little duty there, but also, uh, you know, I, want, I do want people to go tell their friends, you know, get online right now. Okay. I'm going to record that and play it later. Okay. <laughs> this one's called The Witch Hazel Beggar of Chicago Union Station. The bum at Union Station asks me, as I jostle my mocha and scone, can I spare just the last $12 he needs to go and see his mother, who, he promises, just had a stroke. I'm not surprised when he turns and heads opposite the ticket counter, tightening up his hood against the wind. I picture him in some back alley nursing a fifth of night train and a double cheeseburger as cold gnaws the flesh bagging his bones. I wonder if he envies us college boys bound in jackets and scarves, laid over from our job interviews and ski trips, or if he pities our sad, rushing lives without the soft company of pigeons and the lolling rattle of the L spinning overhead, a halo of steel worn each day he waits, waits to inherit the earth. The ticket agent warns of a blizzard from the east, divine wrath from the barred-up gates of that place we were but never were. Snow will gown the Sears Tower, frost will maim the awnings of hotels, spread from the walls of banks, glaze even the witch hazel eyes of my beggar while you and I are inside, far away with heat and music and a leg of lamb. You know I won't pay you back, he says, pocketing my money. I tell him forget it, wish him a Merry Christmas, but he shakes his head and squeezes my arm. Get a kid, you'll never see me again. <laughs> That was the witch Hazel Beggar of Chicago Union Station, Michael Meyerhofer. What, what book is that from, Michael? Uh, that's my first one, Leaving Iowa. Leaving Iowa. Yeah. Oh, I just love the, the title is so <laughs> evocative, too. Yeah, so he really had witch hazel eyes. I That's intriguing. Yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. It was, it was a very, like, it was an account I had just never forgot because... I grew up really poor, and so yeah. I kind of felt that affinity, and then I, I don't know if it was just pretension or whatever, but I was kind of going through grad school, I was trying to like kind of, I guess, put out airs, and uh-huh. it, suddenly I had this life of a, a bit more privilege, and then there's that weird contrast between... You had your leg of lamb. Yeah, right? yeah. You <laughs> yeah. say that, and, and how, you know, how showing that, that image is that it wasn't just that you were going to go off and be all right, it was that you were... Inside, far away, with mm. heat and music and a leg of lamb. Oh. And uh, I love how the protesting, though, of it. Like, you know I'm not paying you back. Yeah, we were just kidding, actually. He, like, grabbed me, and he said, yeah, I'm not going to pay you back. You know, you're not going to see me again. And that just <laughs> him saying that was, was really striking. So in one sense, it was, it's kind of funny in retrospect, but it's also really, really sad because it's true. Yeah. Uh, I never did see him again. Well, but yeah. that's also true of practically everyone that you meet. So. Yeah, and what a... Yeah, what a um, what a way to capture capture that moment. Chicago Union Station. I love it. So, um, let's, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more in a bit, but uh, I want you to get a couple more of these awesome ones in. Uh, we've got First Crush, My Mother Sent Me, and New Year's Eve. What are, you, what are you feeling from those? And then we'll talk a bit more. Uh, let me see. I'll do, I'll do a short one. I'll do My Mother Sent Me. Okay, yes. I, I do believe... Um, Karen read this one on air and she talked a lot about it. And I, and I want you to read it as well. Yeah, good one. Okay. This is where the ones with the title kind of bleeds into the first line of the poem. Okay. My mother sent me a text message from her coffin that said, glad you're not here. She's always doing stuff like that. She says it's to help me savor my remaining days, but I know it's because I'm the only one left who hasn't changed his number. Oh, yeah, so there's the big lump of the throat and the stone. Um, yeah, when she read this, because, you know, you lost your mom at 20, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I I lost my mom who was going to live forever uh, mm-hmm. last April. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, 
I think you're always working in the after, like, especially the first year after everyone had, like, their dream yeah. or their, I have three uh, much older brothers. And I think all of us had, like, a, a dream or a vision or a sense or something, some kind of a message. And, you know, I really didn't want that because I, I get scared easily. Yeah. <laughs> But I, you know, once it happens, you're like, hmm. And then finally, and my father never did, and then finally, like, he had a dream. He had to call me and tell me. He was a very practical field worker, man, you know. Yeah. But, but what about these, you know, the messages that you desire or, or maybe are a little afraid of? Is that, I mean, is that where this came from? Or, I mean, I can only imagine that. I would imagine this is imagination you're using or unless yeah. it's really happened. I guess it was just sort of. It was sort of like, a, I guess, a darkly comedic attempt at kind of touching on the fact yeah. that it, yeah. it's so many years have gone by, about 20 years have happened, uh, so it's, it's almost been as much time since she died as I had with her, you know? Yeah. Uh, of course, she doesn't feel like that at all. It feels like it just happened yesterday. But uh, that event is like, it's kind of like the, uh, the BC, AD of my life, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah. It, it never really seems to go away, and it kind of becomes something that's bigger than her or me. It, it kind of becomes yeah. this metaphor for all of the things. Uh, and then I was mm -hmm. sort of thinking how after she died, you know, everyone in the family was, people were having dreams or they were kind of having like, well, I thought mm -hmm. I, I think at one point my dad said he thought he, he saw her in, in the mirror uh -huh. outside, uh, outside the house, uh, looking out the, the window of the room where she died. And then wow. someone else was with him, and they said they saw the same thing, uh, but they were wow. standing next to each other. Uh, so there were a lot of little things like that, and I never had anything like that. So I was sort of, yeah. in a sense, uh, skeptical of it, and also wanting that at the same time. And then, like you said, of course, you know, scared of it, too. So yeah. with all these, like, total contradictory feelings yeah. kind of squirreling around. Yes, yes. I Yeah, I, I hope you don't mind talking about it, because it is, like, I... I never was someone very much uh, open to, I mean, I would like to think I was open to the universe and its signs mm -hmm. and things, but after she passed, oh, my gosh, it was like, the gloves are off. You're going to get every <laughs> sign and thing happen that can possibly happen. And, yeah, I didn't want, like, a presence, like a real presence. But I, the dreams were all, you know, comforting and such. Mm -hmm. But it's like the person, the one person who doesn't have that, you know, was my dad. And so, he want, you know, he was like, well, why... And, you know, and then he finally got his, but, and, um, swings are a big part of, uh, my mom and my family, she was always swinging, so mm. he, uh, she appeared to him on a swing, and so I'm very open to these things now, like, the other night I had a dream on a swing, and so I take the swing as, like, I I'm kind of, once you have a loss like that, I think it just opens you up to, mm. you know, receiving some of these gifts of, uh, the spirit, uh, divine, and, uh, yeah. Do you have any other poems about your mom? You don't have to read them now, but like... Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that, yeah, that was something I've written about. I could even tell you how many times. Uh, wow. Especially when I first started writing, uh, because I've always kind of dealing with that grief. And yeah, you, I, said I, you started writing, making sense of all this. Your yeah. Your mother's death, your, yeah. your troubled, troubled childhood. Okay, yeah. Because yeah, I, I obviously, uh, I love prose, but there, there's there's something more immediate to to poetry. It's, uh, it's like a, maybe yeah. like a more refined diary entry, I guess, basically. Uh, so, you know, writing about yeah. this over yeah. and over and over again is kind of what, what kind of helped me through, helped me through it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but I still yeah. come back to it, because like I said, it it kind of becomes more than just her, more than just me. It's now like this metaphor that's just intertwined in, in like, my yeah. being. Yeah. So, yeah, so anything, no, and being, yeah, yeah, it, it's sort of like the go-to for for grief or questioning or, um, yeah, or, like, uh, yeah, I find longing. That. So. Yeah, I find that in mine as well, start to be writing. I, I really couldn't write about it for a while. It's been, mm -hmm. like, mm, 16 months. And, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, I think I'm writing this poem about this and it ends up being about my mom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, like, always sort of entering, entering in. Um, so, yeah, we have a batch here of some poems of yours, and I'm wondering, we probably have time for maybe uh, two more, or depending on length. What do, what do you feel like uh, sharing with our listeners? What do I got left here? Uh, let's see. The first crush. I love that. I like, I like them all, though. Oh, right. you're sweet. Okay, uh, I'll do the first crush. All right. See, I, I was, like, not 
prodding at all, right? Yeah, not at all, not at all. <laughs> okay. This one jerk. Okay, well. <laughs> the first question. I was wise until fourth grade gym when Allison's hips jagged and shimmied to the hokey pokey. Before that day, field trips through the diluted holiness of nature, dissecting butterflies and stinkweed, I was really getting somewhere. I learned how plant cells have walls, but ours don't. How we have nothing to fear from sundown. I was the height of a verb, sure, but fresh nouns were streaming in every hour. I bear crawl across the gym mats in my Walmart sweats, and modest as a platypus. Then it happened. The nuns corralled us into a circle. Needle met record, and Ray Anthony's big band told me it was time to shake my inheritance. Across our little circle jived this ribbon thing, hosting anatomical differences we Catholic boys knew nothing about. But she met each command with naked gusto, and I felt that first tectonic shift. Somehow I made it home, bewildered, but sensing that henceforth grasshoppers and baseball would not be enough. No matter that the rest of the world stood still, I have been wobbling ever since. Oh, Again, I'm kind of hiding my little delight behind the microphone here. <laughs> God, first, you nailed that, you know, the feeling, the first question. I didn't know you were a Catholic boy. Yeah. You in a Catholic yeah. school? Yeah, uh, yep. Ah. Catholic school, I was an altar boy. I could probably do a lot of the math and Latin <laughs> if I really think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, maybe here, wait, this is always a test. Can you repeat the Nicene Creed? Oh, no, we didn't do that one. We did the other one, yeah. Oh, you do the other one? Okay, yeah. I'm Lu all right, I'm Lutheran. So we're like almost like you, but yeah, pretty close, you know, yeah. with the exception of Mary and Martin Luther and all that. But um, I always, yeah, okay, so it's not, for you guys it would be, well, it's, you guys it should be Apostles' Creed. Yeah, course. Apostles' Creed, yeah. But, but the Nicene is like super long. It's like 17,000 pages. <laughs> yeah, like it never ends. It's so long. <laughs> I don't know how you... <laughs> like exactly how it is. But see, I pride myself on these weird little things of, of not looking down at the book if I'm in if I'm in church, you know, yeah. it's like you know these little things that little rituals from yeah. uh, childhood on. And, <laughs> but yeah, so and here you are across our little circle, jive this ribbon thing, hosting anatomical differences we Catholic boys knew nothing about. And the last what the last lines here. Somehow I made it home, bewildered, but sensing that henceforth grasshoppers and baseball would not be enough. So honest, you know, you get, talk about, you know, the poetry being the most direct and, and the last one, no matter what the rest of the, no matter that the rest of the world stood still, I have been wobbling ever since the first crash. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, what, is this an early poem? It seems like a uh, poem. Pretty early, pretty early, yeah, pretty early. I was kind yeah, of I always loved everybody's early work, so yeah. I kind of seen that one, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I'm sure I love your most recent work, but I was really stuck in blue collar eulogies because mm -hmm. of just you know what was um, presented to us here and uh, love it all. So what's what else is going on before you, before you read a last poem and bid us adieu? Uh, what's going on with you? You just are you on a tour or just teaching or anything new coming or? I'm really just, just know. yeah, I'm really just teaching now, and I'm kind of like I'm doing fantasy and poetry at the same time. Um, so that, that pretty much those uh -huh. two things okay. take up all the hours of the day. Uh, but I have uh, uh -huh. new manuscripts that I'm sending out. Uh, I need fantasy series, the second uh, my second trilogy just about finished, and then I have okay. I think three to two or three, depending on how you count, uh, new poetry manuscripts that I'm that I'm sending out trying wow. to find a home for. Wow, prolific. So, folks, if you want to, uh, you know, latch on here to, you like what you're hearing, you want to find more and more and more Michael Meyerhofer, go to, what, the troublewithhammers.com, right? Yeah, just troublewithhammers.com, yeah. Yeah, troublewithhammers. And, um, wow, so if you're into fantasy and all of that, pick up those books. If you would like his poetry, like you're hearing here, uh, do that as well. Would you... What is your writing practice for being so prolific? Do you set a time? I always like to ask writers what their writing I don't really, routine is. Yeah, I mean, I have the answers that sound good in interviews, but, <laughs> but the, the, the truth is I don't really have. That yeah. sounds good, and you yeah. can go on your merry way, and then but do yeah, the opposite. <laughs> yeah, for me, I don't really have an exactly routine, but it's different for, uh, for, for fiction versus poetry. Uh, for fiction, when I'm working on a project, I pretty much... You know, lock myself in front of my computer and say, I'm going to work on 
this many pages a day, whether it's writing or drafting or editing or whatever, and that's what I'm going to do, and there's no, there's no way out of it. Uh, for poetry, it just when I, when a, when an image or a memory kind of just pops into my head, I just sit down as quick as I can and start writing, and then um, try to hammer, go into I hammer out a draft. But I don't necessarily have a time where I say I'm, I'm going to write this this many minutes yeah. a day or a week or anything. All right. Well, we won't tell your students. So, uh, it's been so nice having you on the show. Well, um, you. Your work really resonates with me and I'm sure with our listeners as well. And uh, kudos to Karen Wyant, our Scrapper Poet contributor, for bringing you our way for the show. Oh, and uh, what would you like to uh, leave us with today, Michael? Let's see. I have two left. I'll let you pick. I have uh, What to Do If You're Buried Alive in New Year's Eve 2016. Uh... Gosh, I, you, you really pick. I, 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 I'm both. But maybe what to do with your buried alive? Since yeah, I did that. Recent book? Okay. Yeah, that's the title poem for the new one. What to do if you're buried alive. First, you should feel very glad for having read this poem. Don't panic. All you have to do is break the slats. Breathing will be easier if you knot your shirt tight around your face. A call. Your eyes can't help you now, so leave them closed. Don't waste breath on prayers or strength on punches. Instead, use your knees to start an avalanche. Don't stop. When loose soil starts to flow through the cracks, pretend you're riding a bicycle through a rural downpour. Don't mind the splinters. Remember, if you can sit, you can kneel. Then you can stand. Beautiful. That's what to do if you're buried alive, and it's also the title of his latest book. You've been listening to Michael Meyerhofer here on Everyday Poetry, Poetry for the People. And uh, I thank you so much for sharing this hour uh, with us, and uh, good luck to you and all your writing and grading and writing in the margins this weekend. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Take care. Right, we'll have you on again next time. All right. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.